Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Thursday, February 24th, 2022. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast, End the Pandemic, Start the War. From one crisis to the next. Now, let's hope this doesn't escalate into World War III. Of course, you're all aware that Russia decided to invade Ukraine today. I am not going to sit here and play geopolitical foreign policy analyst or expert. I'm going to stay in my lane. Of course, I talk about geopolitics, but I always try to bring it back around to how it's going to impact markets in the economy because that is my lane. That's where I feel comfortable. That's where I can offer some expertise and I think some solid insights in a different perspective than what you're likely going to hear in the mainstream media and even in a lot of independent outlets out there. It's just how I think. It's not uh, on purpose to differentiate myself. This is just how I see the world. This is how I understand economics. It's how I understand the markets, and I share those thoughts and analysis with the audience. So, surprised and not surprised at the same time. Not surprised, obviously, because I have been talking about more conflict likely going to take place, and I've been beating that drum for the past few years. But I am somewhat surprised that Vladimir Putin made the move to do it. Although I think if you look at both sides of the equation, you're looking at it from his perspective, there's obviously some logic to the move. Was it a strategic blunder? I guess time will tell if he either gains Ukraine or if they're able to push him back and if Europe and the United States are able to thwart this attack, time will tell. But what's interesting at this moment is, well, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So despite the fact that the United States in conjunction with NATO and the EU, of course, all partnering up saying that they're in lockstep with everything, that they support the Ukrainian people, blah, 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 blah. That's all fine and dandy. But Ukraine is not a part of NATO. And there's the treaty amongst these nations. There's the understanding amongst these nations, the members of NATO, that if you attack one, if one is attacked then that is an attack on all of them, which basically means, okay, where everybody's going to join the fight. Now, I'm not a big fan of that treaty. It doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to me because what if somebody's poking the bear? Okay, what, what, what if one country's going crazy? Why do I now have to come to his aid when he was instigating a fight with somebody else? I don't like that. Especially not with our blood and treasure. That You know, we were told... From the get-go, by our founding fathers, do not get involved with foreign entanglements. Okay, you have to understand that this country was simply founded by our founders studying history, which basically means they were studying human nature. Because stuff keeps happening over and over and over again. And they just had this bright idea, commonsensical idea. Let's study what we as human beings have done wrong. And let's not do those things. Let's study what human beings have done right. And let's do our best to enshrine those things into our founding documents, into this country, into this experiment, the United States of America. Let's give that a shot. It's not that difficult. That's basically this country in a nutshell. Don't do what, what didn't work. Do what does work and expand freedom as much as you possibly can. Do not get involved with foreign entanglements. Don't, don't mess with other people's affairs. It's a good bit of advice. It's a good bit of advice not to get involved with your neighbor's affairs either. And that's right next door. So, Ukraine not being a member of NATO, 
who's going to come to their defense? Because here's the thing, and this is at least somewhat strategic on the part of Putin. If the United States and or Europe starts to now send weapons, money, any type of support to Ukraine, they're now a party to the fight. They're now saying, oh, we are choosing sides, not just in rhetoric, but in actual action. And what to do? I mean, are you guys ready to go to war? Because basically Putin's calling their bluff. And at this juncture, now who knows what's going to happen, but at this juncture, according to our president today, Joe Biden, he's saying he is not sending U.S. troops to fight this war. Now, he's going to send some to some other European countries, surrounding countries, but we're not going to fight. We're not going to get involved. They're putting on sanctions. They're putting on more sh sanctions. And in time, that should hurt the Russians, blah, 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 blah. The Russians are used to sanctions, as are so many other countries. Are they impactful? Yes, they are. Yes, they are, especially if they're well-designed and well-targeted, which I imagine these ones will be. But do they work overnight? Mm, not really. They do take some time. And it was interesting. Of course, this was Joe Biden speaking off the cuff, so I don't know how we can really hold him to really much anything he says, unfortunately. But nonetheless, this is what he said during his statement this afternoon, and he did take some questions from the press finally, so we'll give him that. But he basically said, well, we'll see what happens with the sanctions in a month's time. In a month's time, Vladimir Putin and the Russian military may have taken Ukraine. Because it all depends on how much of a fight the, Ukraines are go the Ukrainians are going to put up. Because I don't imagine that the Russians are going to pull back anytime soon. Now you're committed. And you also have that slightly veiled threat of, I don't necessarily know if it's going to be nuclear weapons, but that's sort of the wink-wink of it with Vladimir Putin's statements that he made this morning and that he made, I don't remember, it was at least probably at least a month or two ago, talking about potential aggression in the future and basically alluding to, well, if we are met with European and U U.S. forces or anybody else who wants to interfere in our business, we are going to retaliate with means you have never seen before, which one, again, is going to make the assumption that that means some form of nuclear weapon. Let's hope and pray that that is not the case. But here's the thing to saying something like that. If you say it, and somebody crosses that line, you have to do it. That analogy I like to give to the audience from time to time, if you threaten to break somebody's legs, and they cross that line, whatever it might be, you have to break their legs. Otherwise, you're now going to lose all of your credibility. Don't make the threat if you're not going to follow through with it if somebody calls you out. I happen to believe that that is the rationale of Vladimir Putin. I don't think he would make such a statement if he wasn't prepared to back it up. Does he want to use nuclear weapons? I would say no, he doesn't. I would also say, in all honesty, I don't necessarily think that he really wanted to go into Ukraine. Again, there are both sides, multiple sides, of this story. Look at it from his perspective. You have the United States, European nations, of course, this is okay, so making up NATO here, have been surrounding if you will, Russia, getting closer and closer to the Russian border, even capturing some, some countries and bringing them into NATO, and they were supposed to be hands-off, like Estonia and Lithuania and Latvia. They were supposed to be hands-off. Ukraine is supposed to be hands-off. Belarus. These countries that were former members of the Soviet Union. Supposed to be hands off, sort of a dividing wall of a handful of countries between Russia and Europe. Well, now, I'm not going to say that Russia wouldn't have tried to capture Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. 
but NATO did. So maybe they were both going to try to get them, but NATO got them first. I don't know. But that's we know that that did happen. So now, again, looking at this from the Russian perspective. Well, the West captured these few countries that are on my border. They were supposed to be hands off. What's to say they're not going to go after Ukraine, which is a huge country? The examples they're throwing out there today, the size of Texas. Millions of people. Natural resources. Geopolitically, militarily, strategic, strategically placed. See what I'm getting at here? You have to look at things from both sides. The Russian media, the U.S. media, guess what? The Russian government, the U.S. government, all propaganda. So you have to stop and think for yourself. Don't try to be a tough guy and say we got to send other kids over there to die. It's not how it works. This country, thank God, at least from early polling that we're seeing, this is finally something that might bring the country together because you have Republicans and Democrats both by majority, do not want to get involved. Thank God. It's about time. Of course, the sad part of this is somewhat are doing because we're meddling in other people's affairs. And now we're just going to leave them to dry. We were poking the bear. We instigated things. We were putting weapons and lots of money into Ukraine. Now we got to stop, like I said, because if we do it now after the invasion... Now we're taking sides. Now we're getting involved. Now you're stepping it up a notch. And if you're going to do that, well, then what would Russia do? Would they go outside of the Ukrainian borders? Would they go into Poland? Would they go into Latvia, Lithuania, or somewhere else? I don't want to get ahead of myself. This is the first day they're in Ukraine. It's a big country. That's most likely going to be their focus. That's also most likely going to be their own border, if you will. Because if they do go out into a NATO country, well, then you attack one, you attack them all. And that's the other thing of concern. Because what have we been hearing from our own media over the past several weeks? Well, Russia may, may stage a false flag to get involved. Well, there was no false flag that was staged. They just went in from all sides, too, mind you. Everybody thought, well, maybe they were just going from the east where they've announced diplomatic ties with a couple of those territories that Putin mentioned the other day. They came from all angles. See... And the other thing, and I'm going to tie this into the markets, of course, because this is End the Pandemic, Start the Wars, title of today's podcast, as I stated. Is this just a major distraction? Biden couldn't get a handle of the pandemic. Biden can't get a handle on this economy. Failures across the board. When all else fails, they take us to war. That's where we are. But getting back to the false flags and what the media has been telling us. Will a false flag be used by the Europeans, by the United States, to get involved in this conflict? And at that juncture, it's basically going to be an all-out war. Well, we do it. We've used false flags before. That's how we got into Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. This, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is open history. That was admitted by former Defense Secretary McNamara. Okay, so it is not beneath the United States or European nations to stage a false flag attack to get involved in a skirmish, in a conflict, in a war. So the fact that Russia, at this juncture, did not stage a false flag attack, they just went in, well then who may stage a false flag attack 
to fight the Russians? What would be us? It would be NATO. It would be Europe. In one of those NATO countries, there could be, maybe it's a cyber attack, maybe it's a bomb going off, who to, God only knows. And then that'll be justification because you attacked one, you attacked all of us, now we're going to get involved. Bigger escalation, a bigger excuse, a bigger distraction. So the media has been talking about false flag attacks, false flag attacks. What else has the media been telling us for several weeks? And it's on some independent media for months. Beware of cyber attacks. And you know who else has been warning about this for months? Is Klaus Schwab. Okay? I, I, it's amazing how this guy keeps coming back. Don't forget, this is the founder of the World Economic Forum, the Davos Group, the Great Reset guy. All right? The Henry Kissinger wannabe. They both sound the same. You will own nothing and like it. Remember that? I talk about this all the time. Again, not a conspiracy theory. And that's the other funny thing with the mainstream media because... The only time they ever talked about false flag attacks was when, they, was when they were trying to put down or belittle somebody that they were all declaring to be a conspiracy theorist because that so-called conspiracy theorist, whoever he or she may have been, was saying that a country may be using a false flag attack to get involved here or there. But now it's perfectly okay for the mainstream media to talk about false flags. Before, that was just relegated to the conspiracy theorists. Those things don't really exist. But now, it's mainstream, perfectly okay. Of course, not for the United States to do it, because no, 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 we're, we're much better than that. But that might be something that the Russians use to get involved. Well, they didn't. They just went in. So will we use one to get involved? Time will tell. Let's hope not. So, cyber attacks, that could be the other thing. Again, like I said, that could be the excuse, the justification. What happens if the banking system is attacked and people can't get their money, people can't transact, businesses can't function, shuts down the economy? What happens if our grid is attacked, can't function, shuts everything down? That's how dependent we are on electricity, on the internet, that's the system, that's the way of life, for better or worse. And who knows, maybe it would be the Russians that would attack us. Maybe it wouldn't be. Maybe it's a false flag. If you don't understand this by now, you never will. These people in power do not care about you. There, there's Countries are here to be used to get people all jazzed up. They don't care about countries. They don't care about borders. You know, the, the conservative argument is, well, he, Joe Biden, he, he cares more about the uh, Ukrainian border than he does the U.S. border. Okay, valid point. But really, at the end of the day, he doesn't care about either border. You get it? It's all about money and power. If they have to talk about borders to get you... To, to vote for them, then that's what they're going to say. That's what they're going to do. They don't care. They don't care about you. They're all psychopaths and sociopaths. That's why they can start wars like that. They can talk about them. They Because they're not going. You're going. Your kids are going. Your sons are going. Your daughters are going. They're not. Their kids aren't going. It's not their money either. It's your money. It's all your hard-earned tax dollars that's going. You either understand this by now or you don't. If you do, then you can see what's going on here. If you don't, then you're going to buy all the propaganda. You're going to pretend to be a tough guy because you want to go kill somebody that you don't know. In another country that's never done anything to you. That ain't right. 
We got to stop thinking like this. The other thing, you watch the UN Security Council, the United Nations, the other night. The United States, the UK, they got a lot of balls, man. They got a lot of audacity to say the things that they said. Give peace a chance. Talking about remo- telling Russia, remove your planes, remove your tanks, blah, 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 blah. Go back home. Where have we been? Where have we been for the past 20 years? All over God's creation, invading other countries. False pretenses. There are no weapons of mass destruction. Give peace a chance. Talk. Oh, no, not going to do that now. We're in the Middle East. We got things to do. We got money to make. We have oil to take. And of course, that all turned into a quagmire, didn't it? Hundreds of billions of dollars gone. Thousands of lives lost. U.S. military, tens of thousands of Iraqis. Hundreds of thousands displaced, turned into refugees. Lives destroyed. But that was perfectly okay. And then you have the mess of getting out of Afghanistan. What a disaster that was. And we should have been out of there long ago. But I don't ever remember the U.S. or the U.K. ever telling themselves at a U.N. meeting, give peace a chance, send your troops back home. I'm not, I don't, I don't want you to think that I am rooting for the Russians and rooting against the United States of America. That is simply not the case. I am telling you what's going on and what has been going on. If you don't understand that I'm a, an American patriot through and through, then shame on you for what I stand for and what I believe. I am saying these things and criticizing my country and my government because I love my country. And I'm sick and tired of making the same damn mistakes over and over again. For ego, for greed, because you want to be a tough guy. You're not tough. When you want to send somebody else to do the fighting. I'm sick of it. And thank God Americans are waking up. As I just stated earlier. Republicans and Democrats both are against getting involved in this skirmish, which conflict and, of course, with the people on the ground, it's a war. All depends on where you are as to how big and bad it is. We got to we we have to stop this stuff. We we have to stop it. Unfortunately, I believe it's going to get much, much worse before it gets better. So. Let's tie this back into the markets. Let's tie this back into the broader economy. The Russian stock market experienced one of the worst sell-offs in history. Not just the Russian. I'm not just talking the Russian market. I'm talking global markets. History. One of the worst ever. Plunging as much as 45% intraday. Closing down a little over 30%. Huge drop Our markets, early in the day, were selling off drastically. Well, I shouldn't say drastically, but in today's age, my God, half a percent sell-off, and everybody thinks it's Armageddon. A couple percentage points. Then it rallies a few percentage points to the upside, following President Biden's remarks. Those types of moves, that big intraday swing, The only time we've ever seen those types of moves in history, in U.S. markets. Well, you guessed it. In major bear markets or at the beginning of big crashes in bear markets. This is not normal functioning. This is not normal behavior for the stock market. This is what you see in a crash This is what you see in a bear market. And a crash and a bear market are not the same thing. Understand. A crash, sure, it can happen quickly. Sure, a bear market, that type of decline of 20% from all-time highs can happen quickly. But it can also be an orderly process. 
So I just want to make that distinction. I just want you to understand that a crash in a bear market is not necessarily the same thing. But when you see that type of volatility, when you see that type of intraday movement, and we've been seeing several of these. So to me, these are the four shocks. Again, this is my volatility model too at work. When you see these types of movements, something is on the horizon. And it typically is not good. So that's another thing. Is this the distraction? Is, is this conflict part of the distraction? Because guess what? This will be another excuse for the Federal Reserve and other central banks to say, well, oh, you know, we were maybe thinking about increasing interest rates and um, removing some liquidity from the markets and putting a pause on the expansion of our balance sheet, maybe even reducing our balance sheets a little bit. But, you know, they couldn't do it in the pandemic. How are they going to do it if there's a war breaking out? So it gives them cover. It also gives our government, other governments, other central banks, and ours cover to say, look, the market's selling off. Well, that's, that's because uh, we're at war. Or we might be going to war. Russia's there. Ukraine's fighting. Who else might get involved? So that's the boogeyman. It's not our fault. It's not our fault we spent money we didn't have. It's not our fault we stole trillions of dollars from young generations and future generations yet to be. And there are consequences for that. Oh, no. Cheap money for two decades? No, there's no negative side effects of that. Not, none whatsoever. Not our fault that the markets were selling off. It's the pandemic. It's supply chain disruptions. It's the Russians. Always something else. No responsibility. No accountability. I've been telling you that since this podcast has been online for three years. Same song and dance. Nothing's changing, unfortunately. But it's getting worse. That's what's changing. Things are getting worse. They're coming to a head. Because nobody wants to take responsibility or accountability. Nobody wants to say we've made a mistake. Nobody said, yes, we've done all these things. Yes, we've gotten involved with these foreign entanglements. We have to stop doing it. And in exchange for us changing our behavior, you change yours as well. And back and forth we go. Your little trust but verify situation. Baby steps at first, then you can take bigger steps. Then you can take leaps. Might be surprised what we can do as human beings if we work together as opposed to try to kill each other all the time. Might be surprised, might be amazed by what we can accomplish together. What else might be going on here? Is it a distraction that's being run for the Chinese? Or might the Chinese just take advantage of all of this chaos by taking a stronger stance against Hong Kong, which they've basically absorbed, and Taiwan. So is Joe Biden, the United States, is Europe, are they going to be able to handle two different fronts? Are they going to be able to handle Russia and Ukraine and China and Taiwan? Because let's just be real, China has basically absorbed, they've taken Hong Kong. And don't forget, that was really the start of a lot of these major global protests back in 2019. Remember that? We were I was talking about that all the time and saying how that was going to lead to more. That was just the start. And then COVID-19 happens. The end of 2019, early 2020. Put your mask on, get inside, don't come out. Puts a tamper, puts a lid on all of those global protests that were that were global. They didn't get a lot of media attention. They got attention here at the Capitol News, I can guarantee you that, and you know it. And I told you they were just getting started, and I told you they were going to get worse. And they did, and here we are. You see what was going on up in Canada still taking place. Removed, thank God, for now at least, for now at least, those emergency powers have been revoked. We'll see if they come back. A lot of stuff going on in there. 
2020 was a bad year, wasn't it? I told you buckle up for 2021. You getting the popcorn ready for 2022? Fireworks. And this is just getting started too. So back to the markets. How does this impact the global economy? Well, as I stated the other day, and this was really in relation, well, it was, it was about everything, really. It was about Canada. It was about Russia and Ukraine at the time the other day. I said also be on the lookout for commodities. In this case, of course, everybody understands oil and gas with Russia. But the other thing you have to pay attention to, too, are fertilizers and fertilizer prices and the sourcing of those fertilizers and where does the bulk of them come from? Canada, Russia, Belarus, and China. In that order, Russia being a distant fourth, Canada by far the leader, but Russia and Belarus are nothing to sneeze at. And Belarus is an ally of Russia. If they should stop exporting their fertilizer, what do you think is going to happen to food prices, which are already going through the roof? A major input good to fertilizer is natural gas. Well, who's a major producer of natural gas but Russia? They're at war. They want to starve the enemy. They're not going to send it. Food prices are going to skyrocket. Millions of people are going to starve to death. This is just getting started. I hope I'm wrong. But if this continues, then I will be proven right. This is not difficult to connect the dots. You just have to be aware of it. This is Russia. This is some of their main commodities. This is the percentage of global supply. Okay? Russian commodity production percentage of global supply. Natural gas, 17%. Crude oil, 12%. Fertilizers, 12%. Again, just Russia. Wheat, 10%. Refined nickel, 6%. Refined aluminum, 6%. We're seeing those prices, nickel and aluminum, going through the roof as well, hitting decade highs. Wheat hit a decade high. Over $9 a bushel. When was the last time we had prices like this? Oh, that's right, 2011, the start of the Arab Spring. The price of wheat, really the price of bread, is a great barometer and a great indicator for when revolutions and major pro protests start. Historically speaking, just getting started. Now, Russia, 10%. Of global wheat supply, wheat supply comes from Russia. You add Ukraine to the mix, it's almost 25%. Global corn supply, Russia and Ukraine is about 13%. If a pandemic isn't going to kill you, if war isn't going to kill you, then they're going to starve you. I mean, this is biblical. One, two, three. They're, they're not done. Just, just getting started. And if there is a cyber attack, which they have been broadcasting for months, it's going to cripple everybody. People, especially in this country. Because people don't know how to survive. A lot of people, in, especially in the big cities, they don't know how to survive. People are on their phones or gadgets all day. They're not going to know how to cope. They're not going to know how to do anything. And that's, that's, that's really the small end of it. Think about the hospitals. Think about your critical infrastructure, your water treatment. We're still in the winter. People heating their houses, trying to stay warm. About water, okay? I mean, this can get out of hand really, really fast. Oil prices, WTI, $95 a barrel. Brent, $101.81. And, and 
Gold, $1,914 per ounce. Silver, $24.37 per ounce. Again, wheat, $9.34 a bushel. And lumber keeps inching higher also. Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note is still flirting with the two-handle, yielding 1.96%. And then if you take a look at the cryptos, you look at Bitcoin, this, that, or the other, I mean, look, Bitcoin is a Bitcoin as far as I'm concerned. This audience understands my take on Bitcoin. This is not a hedge against inflation. It's not a hedge against uh, geopolitical risk. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. It, it, it is a risk asset. It's a very risky asset. It's a levered risky asset at the end of the day. It's a lottery ticket. Uh, maybe you get lucky. That's not an investment thesis in my book. But it's your money. You do with it what you want. Bitcoin has only ever existed in a world of ultra-low interest rates. It has only ever existed in a world of quantitative easing and massive central bank expansion of their balance sheets. It has only existed in a massive and historic bull market. Take all those things away because the music always stops. The punch bowl is always taken away. It ends up empty at some point. Do you really think that Bitcoin is going to have a leg to stand on? Hmm? Maybe. I mean, anything's possible, I suppose. But I don't think so. I believe in precious metals. I believe in gold and silver. Why? Because there's thousands of years of historic precedent. Gold and silver have seen it all. They've seen the rise and fall of empires that we still study, that we still write about, that some people still long for. Oh, if I could go back to a period of time, I'd like to go back to the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, I'd like to go back to the Persian Empire, blah, 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 blah. Gold and silver have seen it all. They're manipulated. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I bet Bitcoin is too. That, that The concentration of the wallet holders or whatever they call them See, that's even more concentrated than the stock market. So all of these arguments by people who are big proponents of Bitcoin saying it's for the little guy, give me a break. The vast majority of it is held by 0.01%. And it's decentralized according to these idiots. They have no argument. They have no leg to stand on. They just have a lottery ticket and they want to be billionaires. Hey, I don't blame you for wanting to be a billionaire, a millionaire, have some financial freedom and go see the world or do whatever you want. I get it. But don't make stuff up. Don't, don't be like some pump and dump scam artist. Just admit that it's a lottery ticket and you're hoping that you get your numbers. Because that's all it is at the end of the day. But I digress. So this is the world we live in in 2022. It's only February. End of February already. It's already going fast. But that's exactly what's going on here. It's end the pandemic. It's start the war. They got away with what they got away with during the pandemic. And who knows what information. Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe this is part of the distraction from the pandemic too. Because maybe there's going to be some information that starts coming out about COVID-19 and some of these strains and maybe some of the vaccines, the quote-unquote vaccines that they force so many people to take or just damn near try to force people to take with all of the propaganda and the messaging and the guilt trips. You got to take it, if not for yourself, for this person and that person. And you're a good person, aren't you? And you don't want that person to get sick. So don't you want to do it? Maybe there's some information that's going to come out. It's not going to look too good. But if we're at war, or we're concerned about some other people who are at war, well, that's on the back burner now. I'm not going to be surprised by anything, because the CDC just admitted that they withheld data. See, that ain't right, Jack. Not in the United States of America, not anywhere, but especially not in the United States of America. You're going to give somebody an experimental drug, which is exactly what all of these shots are, then the people who are taking them 
for whatever reason they decide to do it, because they genuinely believe in it, or they've just been scared to death and they think that this is the remedy. They have the right to know what is being put into their body. They have the right to know what are the short-term effects and what are the long-term effects of this thing. Potentially. Now, I guess they wouldn't know what the long-term effects are because it's new. Hasn't been proper testing. So we really don't know. You're the guinea pig. Maybe some short-term side effects, some rationale, something. I mean, these aren't the first mRNA shots to be tried. These are just the first ones to be approved in an emergency. Let's not go with the ones that have worked in the past. Let's try a completely different technology in the middle of a pandemic. Let's just go with that, Jack. Let's just give that a shot. That's exactly what they did. They got emergency youth authorization. And that's it. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I think if you took it, and even if you didn't, you have every right to know what's in it. We granted these companies, these major pharmaceutical companies, we, we, we gave them immunity, basically. The government gave them immunity. Not only did they give them immunity, they gave them billions and billions and billions of dollars. I mean, this was just a win-win proposition for these pharmaceutical companies. Couldn't lose. Unless, of course, they knew these shots weren't going to work or they knew they were going to be quite risky. And if that information, if that happens to be true and that information surfaces, surfaces hmm, well, then that sounds like fraud to me. And I would have to think that that would null and void any type of immunity that they have. Now, that's speculation. But there are some murmurings that I'm hearing from some sources out there that I find reputable. And I'm just going to sort of leave it at that because we'll see what happens in time. But nonetheless, this could be a distraction from some of the data that starts to come out with respect to COVID-19, where the strain came from, any type of gain of function, how involved was the United States in Wuhan and in working with these labs and maybe other labs around the world? What's going on with these vaccines? Short-term effects, long-term effects. Because you're getting some information that's coming from insurance companies globally. That there are a lot of younger people who have been dying. Okay, now, is it because of COVID-19? Is it because of the vaccine? Mm. Look into it. I'll continue to look into it. I'll continue to keep you informed on all of this. But when all else fails, they take us to war. Don't ever forget it. They want us divided because they want to conquer us. That's exactly what they've done. It's exactly what they continue to do. No accountability, no responsibility. The markets, the pandemic, immigration, whole host of issues. Let's distract. Let's go pick a fight with somebody. Let's pray. A lot of people are saying, let's pray for the Ukrainians. I say pray for everybody. Don't just pick and choose. Pray for everybody. We all need help. Because it's clear as day that we don't know what the hell we're doing. Because we are so far astray, it's not even funny. Stay safe out there. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.